The video game industry is a harsh mistress. Let's be frank, there are more games out there nowadays than there ever have been. And to make it in this industry, you frankly need a ton of luck if you're a smaller game, even if that game has been polished so brightly that it could burn out your retinas. Sure, you get success stories of games like Fall Guys and Among Us, but for every one of those, you get a series of games that may find a small audience, but isn't indicative of the fantastic experience that you will take part in. That's what this list is for. And you may be going, Dragnix, I know you may not like 2020, but that's the wrong year in the title. No, for this list, that's the right year. Due to me moving at this time last year, I didn't do my normal 2019 overlooked game list. I'm here this year to set that right. Don't worry, you'll get a 2020 list as well, later on in the week. At least I hope. But I'm going back and writing a wrong here. Because man, 2019 was a year of games that you probably never even heard of, unless you follow this channel, hint hint. And hell, even if you do, there will still be games that will surprise you on this list. So what's the criteria for an overlooked game? Well, for me, it's a game that hasn't gotten the attention it deserves and is very, very small, whether it be through sales or critically, or both in most cases. I'm not talking about games that still did well, but maybe aren't the darlings of the press or the YouTube field. I'm not talking about games like Fall Guys, or even games like Baba Is You, which yes, I think undersold for the quality of the game that it was. No, I'm talking about games that haven't sold a bunch, or specifically having gotten that many user reviews on Steam. For this list, I'm excluding any game that has over 2,000 Steam reviews. Yeah, that kind of game. The one where even the algorithm may have trouble picking it up. The deeply buried gems of Steam. Granted, this list will be PC focused for sure, but many of these games have ports to other consoles. And let's be frank, this channel is really focused on PC indie games more than anything else. So enough talk. Here are the top 15 overlooked games of 2019. Number 15. The World Next Door. A pseudo visual novel with gameplay elements. The World Next Door is one of those games that's a story type player's game which just needs a little bit more to enjoy it in terms of the gameplay element. It tells a tale about a human coming to a demon college thanks to a couple of online friends she's talked with, only to find herself in the middle of a real pickle as a portal to the human world closes. And if she can't open it in a few days, she sorta of will die. This causes her to go on a journey of magical discovery and she and her friends find clues to try to learn about the mysterious college and what secrets it has. The game has a nice art style that separates it from the others in the genre, fusing fantasy elements with a more typical anime style, setting the tone for a fusion between high school drama and problems with a magical world that won't be for everyone, hence why it's at the bottom of this list. Don't get me wrong though, I think the writing and characters here are solid, taking advantage of typical stereotypes seen at high school and fusing in demon and magical elements wisely. The story's pace does well in conjunction with the match 3 gameplay that has a very fun base in casting spells at enemies while moving around tiles, and really would be something I would love to see expanded as the game's difficulty does not get the most out of it, at least in my opinion, but hey, it is something different and something that I did enjoy. Honestly, a lot of the intro games that you saw, and this game, The World Next Door, fought for this bottom spot on this list, and any of them could have gotten the nod here, and I changed on a regular basis. The World Next Door did win in the end thanks to feeling fresher than a lot of other games in the genre. So, I'll give it to The World Next Door, at least for now. Number 14, Songbird Symphony. A game as charming as Songbird Symphony can easily be overlooked as just another casual experience for those looking for something to bring up their spirits. 
That would be a mistake, however, as Songbird Symphony is more than just a charming little bird that an old lady wants to feed. The main story about a young bird coming of age and finding out who he is is charm personified. It's sold by Cheery Animations and great characterization of birds using stereotypes that you would expect of bird species. The color and drawing style add a lot of life to the game and make you want to see the next open world animation. But what may surprise you is that the rhythm gameplay isn't something to shake a stick at either. It's not a hardcore experience. Veterans of the genre may be taken back by the change in not only the speed of notes coming in at times, but the changing of the play area as well. But it's smartly designed to keep you on your toes. The game's focus on keeping the rhythm, the sole element to keep your ear on, is great. Accuracy is all based on the music, and it is precise, using elements of Simon Says to get a jump on things as well. It will win you over with its charm, but it's a solid game nevertheless, and definitely worth its price of admission. Number 13. Blazing Beaks in the ever-growing world of top-down roguelite shooters, it's very understandable that many of them start to blur together over time, to the point where it feels like you're just playing another one on the list. Blazing Beaks on the surface looks like a game just like that, but its high difficulty will ruffle a few feathers of even veterans of the genre. The game's unique pull is the game's artifact system where picking up these artifacts will actually curse your burb with anything from dropping all their hearts when hit to actually being chased by ghosts in levels. It's all part of a risk and reward mechanic, however, because as the more negative artifacts you take on, the bigger payout you get when you trade it in at the local bar, getting power-ups and maybe even a new weapon. This risk and reward is vital for making it further into the game, but its core difficulty with low health and enemy attack patterns will keep you coming back for the core experience. The visuals, while maybe not the best out there, do a good job of showing the action and not getting in the way. And the game has a pace to it that doesn't screw around. It's the perfect game to just play a few rounds off after a tough day at the office. Number 12. Gato Roboto Sometimes a game may be designed to be a great infection vector for a specific genre and maybe not for the hardcore gamer out there. What I mean by that is, it's a game that's good for beginners of the genre, to help them understand how the game can be fun, but keeps things rather simple in order to focus on those simple strengths. That's what Gato Roboto is, a cute little game that introduces players to the concepts of Metroidvania in a contained three-hour experience. And you get to play as a cat in a mech suit. I mean, did you really need a better protagonist than that? The controls feel exactly where they need to be, and enemy placement and attack patterns are relatively simple. But again, that's the whole point of the game in general, using the KISS principle. But what separates Gato compared to others like it in the genre is the charm of small things like the sound effects of breaking crates that give this satisfaction that is hard to match. These small moments and pseudo successes carry moment to moment gameplay without asking too much of the player. Yes, the game has a relatively easy difficulty curve without feeling like it's handing itself on a silver platter but it still does have element of skill for veterans of the genre with things like the missile jump to make sure that they don't feel left out. Granted, you are here for the cute presentation and story more than anything else, but it serves as a good game to not break your wallet, yet ease a player into the genre in case they were always curious but never were willing to take the plunge. J Reviews, I know you're watching this, this is the type of game that would be your first Metroidvania. Number 11. Demon Crawl. Listen, yes, I know. You're going to look at the screen and tell me, Dragnex, that's Minesweeper. It's literally Minesweeper. How is this counting for an overlooked game if it was on every Windows PC in the 90s? Yes, you're right. 
It is Minesweeper, but it's Minesweeper with RPG elements that actually make you stop and think about what's going on, and all in a colorful package that helps push it to a spot on this list. The idea here is that each mine is a monster, and monsters can hurt you if you click on them, killing you if more powerful than your remaining HP. It's the RPG mechanics that feel well thought out here, as each item and ability that you pick up hit a range of taking out already seen enemies that can hurt you to protecting yourself against, you know, randomly guessing. Quests to unlock new abilities help give you purpose on how to play or change your playstyle. And a ton of strategies develop here for when to actually take a guess in an area, to whether or not to convert possible great treasures into hearts for health because you need that health. In fact, part of the reason it works so well from the RPG side of things is that, well, there's so much variance in the items in quest over time. And for a game like Minesweeper, designed to have you come back and again and again, that was a wise choice by the developers to do so. Take a look. Number 10. Ape Out. Look, you're a giant ape that's beating the crap out of random guards by flinging them off of buildings and punching their lights out. Exactly what more do you want from a game? Oh, you do want more? Well, how about a very dynamic music system that highlights the action, picking up the pace as you frantically avoid bullets and try to find your way to knock out the next mean man? How about a very stylized presentation that I will admit may be hard for some to adjust to? but makes it stand out especially in the animation department, where movement feels film-esque. How about systematic action strategy that focuses on throwing enemies at other enemies, using environments as cover while still keeping the pace up, and a good variety of enemy placements that mean you won't get bored even during long sessions of the game. Now look, Devolver Digital is known for games like this, very highly stylized and keeping up the action. And Ape Out, despite that, didn't sell as well as it should have. Go fix that. Please. Number 9. Clea. Horror is in the weird place right now for me in general in both games and movies. It's easy to look at things like Five Nights at Freddy's and some of the mainstream horror titles and realize how the jump scare has taken over the genre. You know, that horror, it can work, it really can. Five Nights at Freddy's is a good design in many cases, but for me, it is a game that won't get under my skin. It'll make me jump, but it won't bury itself and make me tense up for periods of time, and that's what I want out of horror. No, it's games like Clea that will make me do that. A slow but methodical pseudo-stealth and puzzle game, Clea is about avoiding the horrors within the Whitlock Mansion and trying to escape the deadly monster and chaos servants with your brother in tow. You'll do that by ducking into cabinets and attempt to listen to the footsteps of servants coming at you, and you'll be able to do that thanks to some of the best informational sound design for a horror game, especially at an indie level. You'll be able to learn of how close and how fast a servant is approaching thanks to that design here, but it's all information that's served to you in a generic dish. It's up for you to interpret what all the information it's giving you and how to actually take it in. Which leads to the fact that you are tense throughout the playthrough. The fact is is that you'll be able to learn it only after getting a couple of clues here and there and putting it together. But when you run into an enemy, you're like, oh god, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Then you learn a little here, you learn a little there, and you tense up when you do realize that, oh god, they're coming right at me. That's the thing about Clea. It's all about that tension and yes, the story is generic, but also does the job for the horror genre. And the presentation is nice too, but it's all about the tension here. And if you like to be put on edge, well, Clea is for you. Number 
Number eight, Hypnospace Outlaw. Okay, some of you may have problems relating to this game from the get-go, but for us old folk on the internet, this game is a blast from the past, the early days of the internet. Hypnospace Outlaw captures those early days of the 90s with the over-the-top gaudy web pages, with ridiculous animated GIFs, horrible graphics, and absurd sound elements. Your job as a pseudo-censor for the new days of this internet is an interesting take on the detective genre, having you look for infractions through a various variety of different web pages, from fan pages to music groups to conspiracy pages about the government. This style of clicking through pages allows you to appreciate the sheer amount of detail that went into every element here. Those elements like the purposely bad looking Neopets ripoff that looks like it was made by an 8th grader. But what's surprising here is the underlying storylines that are created through these web pages that are really captivating in weird ways. Granted, there will be some frustration without using a walkthrough for some, but I would strongly advise not to use it until it's a last resort. Getting lost and finding some weird ass thing is part of what makes this game great, even if you don't have the nostalgia element like some of us older people do. There's a lot about the idea of content, about free speech, about what it would do to the minds of the people who are on this site in terms of what's going on with it. But the game is also not that preachy about it either. It's a good time that is a great silly change of pace game, perfect for when you want to just turn yourself off to the rest of the world and get lost in one that's a little bit out there. Number 7. The Textorcist, The Story of Ray Bibia. You may look at the combination of the two genres listed on the Steam Store page of The Textorcist and go, wait, how in the heck would that work? Bullet hell and a typing game all in one? Well, surprisingly, The Textorcist pulls it off, although it does take a little bit of time to get used to the game's mechanics. You'll have to sort of discard some of your preconceived notions of how to play a bullet hell game in general, specifically in movement, as it'll send you down a path of frustrations if you're bullheaded about it. But if you do adjust, you'll find a game that feels completely different from many other games in both genres, and that's the type of game that I want to highlight on this list. Deciding whether or not to keep typing with one hand to keep moving to dodge bullets, or going full aggro by typing with both hands can cause second to second decisions in this game that keep the tension high. The bullet patterns punish bad positioning smartly without feeling unfair. And the game surprised me every now and again despite being a veteran in both genres. The game's pacing with fight mechanics is the right touch of introducing new mechanics to keep you guessing without wearing out old mechanics in the process. Now the visual presentation may not exactly do wonders for people despite complementing the action and the gameplay wisely, but the music shines through in keeping you amped up for the challenge while being appropriate for the moments in question. The humor here is spot on, legitimately getting me for a hearty chuckle, even at times a joke will miss or two. Most of the time it does hit. Look, of all the games on this list, this is the one I will define as most experimental. But it's a smart experiment nevertheless, and one that you may want to try. Number 6. Hell is Other Demons. Hell is Other Demons will draw you in with its neon-infused art style that's able to translate easily in each of the game's different areas and different types of color palettes. But you'll want to keep playing thanks to the action-oriented gameplay that rewards absolute precision without dropping a beat. 
It drops in bullet hell mechanics into a platforming world rather easily, making you feel like a badass when you wipe out a good variety of enemies from level to level. But what's important here is that it doesn't entirely overdo it. Hell is Other Demons pushes you with different weaponry to the point where things may start to get absurd. Okay, they do get absurd in the presentation portion. But then it stops before it starts to feel like the game is asking you to move mountains for it. It doesn't overdose that adrenaline in any one area. And sure, you could go and, you know, go wave 69 on a wave by wave basis and keep on playing. But it never got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to stop because I just can't handle this anymore. That's what it balances rather well. And frankly, some of the RPG elements with some of the buyable items and things that change your character a little bit help give the game a longer lasting life. The game is one of those games that you could play a little here, play a little there, and just, well, have a good amount of fun with. It's a game you could easily dump hours into it because it's simple to control, but it's very, very hard to master. But it is so thrilling and so rewarding when you finally do. Number 5. River City Girls Of all the games on this list, this is the one that you've probably heard of. And truth be told, I almost disqualified it despite it falling under the criteria. Mostly because I know the numbers that I can't see probably put it off the list. Because, well, you played it on the Switch or probably the Xbox Game Pass. But regardless, I'm willing to make an exception or in particular, keep it on the list because it's a simple yet layered beat-em-up that highlights a resurgence in the genre over the last several years. And well, it's very beautifully designed. It's the perfect kind of game to pick up with a friend and just have fun. You know that word, fun? Look, I will say that based on what I see, it's not a game for the most hardcore veterans of the genre. But people who have enjoyed the genre here and there, or even a bit, will still find a lot here. I love the flip of normal gender roles, as you believe Kyoko and Masako can kick as much ass as they do. And the game does have some good combos and RPG progression systems to help you get engulfed in playing over and over again. The humor is strong with great jokes, and the personalities of the girls shine through. And while there are weird difficulty spikes that can hamper the game at times, it is a game that, well, frankly rewards just the simple positioning of characters properly and thinking about how to next take down an enemy without putting yourself at risk. Paired with a wonderful soundtrack, River City Girls, yeah, you probably won't remember it in 6-8 to eight years. But frankly, sometimes that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because right now, if you play the game, you're gonna have a fun time. And in this world, in COVID, yeah, we need a little bit more fun. Number 4 The Princess, The Stray Cat, and Matters of the Heart it's very easy to look at the surface of The Princess, The Stray Cat, and Matters of the Heart and see a game that's along the line of a lewd visual novel that is only there to tantalize the user. Which, let's be clear, the game does have nude scenes in the Japanese version, which can't be in the Steam version, and there's some stuff regarding rights there and whatnot, but there's nothing wrong with lewd games in general in my mind, to each their own. But to give Stray Cat that label would be a huge mistake, because behind the various waifus that will be the center of these story arcs lies a game that has heartfelt emotion and charm that will win even the toughest of hearts over. Having a good story pace and characters with unique storylines that all are fulfilling in their own way, what brings Stray Cat towards the top of this list is the emotion behind it. You feel for the struggles of the girls like Yuki, who has to juggle working, being a role model for her fellow students, and a troubled past 
that can rear its head in some bad ways. Or the more straightforward story of Nietzsche, who is dealing with home troubles and expectations, and yet opens up a sensitive side of her that you don't see coming in the way that it does. It helps that the Japanese voice acting here is some of the best I've heard. Even with not understanding Japanese myself, the emotion of each character as they pour their hearts out, their struggles, their wants, they are all here. Look, I'm not ashamed to say it, I cried several times during playing the game, because these stories felt real, and quite frankly these girls felt real. And yes, it is a humorous game in the big picture, but that humor is good and it also does do a good job of putting those serious moments into perspective. That's what pushes it to the front of the list, the feels and the comedy. It is a good combination that many visual novels try to get, but the stray cat gets a lot of it. Number three. Yuppie Psycho. Games number 15 through 4 of this list are games that I feel bad about not selling as well as they should. They don't make me lose sleep over them or anything, but every now and again I'll remember them and I'll get a little sad. But for the top 3 games of this list, I seriously want to consult with a lawyer to sue the entire gaming universe for severe negligence, for not buying these games in a reasonable quantity. Granted, of the top three games here, Yuppie Psycho does have seemingly the most buys at 100,000 to 200,000 based on Steam Spy, but we know those numbers aren't entirely accurate. But with a horror game that actually got under my skin in the right ways, yeah, I wanted to see it do a little bit better. What Yuppie Psycho understands better than many of the other games in the genre is that a great story hook with characters you actually care about will go a long way in selling the experience. Brian Pasternak looks like a typical salaryman that the player can project into on the surface, but you end up understanding why he's come to Sintracorp, why the world has been built the way it has, and it sets the tone that many modern games wish they could in atmosphere. Granted, the atmosphere that Yuppie Psycho draws is a bit odd, splitting between a satire of the working adult lifestyle, mixing in humor to help offset the actual real creepy visuals, and psychedelic yet not real vibe the game is going for. While the gameplay does take a backseat to the story, that's not entirely fair to it. Creeping around Centricorp, attempting to figure out puzzles while looking at all the creepy interactables and trying to piece together what happened there, moves the game along in the right ways. Puzzles require thought and don't fall into bad logic traps while still making you actually think about a solution. Yes, you will die here and there to a boss fight and may get frustrated as you try to get by an enemy that's trying to kill you but it's not enough to overwhelm you to the point where you're wanting to turn off the game, but more so, encouraging you to try again. Look, the less you know about Yuppie Psycho, the better the experience is. Just do yourself a favor, buy it, and play it. Number 2. Zanki Zero Last Beginning This one really surprised me when I went back looking for games on this list. You'd think a game by the studio that did the Danganronpa franchise, yes I know, majority of those people have moved on, would have had more eyes on it to begin with. I don't think the lack of advertising and day one reviews helped the game at all. But having a reasonably unique mechanic with 7 days for each character to live and come back, the aging mechanic in general giving you certain boons in certain age groups, and a dungeon crawler that runs circles around games like Stranger of Sword City in terms of design, no you're the one scarred by that game by the way, would have done better than it actually did. The difficulty selection mixed with resource rarity helped give you reasons to push your team. 
and getting stronger by dying in unique ways for each character to mold them into a particular archetype was really refreshing and played to the game's overall themes of death and rebirth. However, why you want to play the game is of course the story, which I found to be a natural companion piece to the Danganronpa games while still being completely different from them in many ways. Sure, you've got themes of death, but it's more about death being a new beginning in certain ways, and how the end of the world can bring perspective to even the most tragic of characters. And characters is exactly where Zanki Zero shines the most. The main eight characters in the party all complement each other with diverse personalities, surprising backstories that really reward you for paying attention to little details, and interactions that really sell you on these eight different personalities actually being able to interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis and come to care for each other despite their differences. And no character takes the back seat here. Yes, you do have characters that you first think may be Yasha heroing it up, but even those characters show so much depth and complexity that you'll fall in love with them and wonder why don't they make a sequel to this game? Why don't they do more with it even if it is a 60 plus hour game? It's not a game to take lightly. It's a game that you will end up being engrossed by when you start playing it. And yeah, that's a little bit weird for a dungeon crawler. Sometimes you just want to play here and there. But Zenki Zero and these characters are some of the best written ones of 2019 and would have been on top of my games of the year list nevertheless. And well, for it to only sell 50,000 copies and less on Steam, that needs to be fixed. Number 1 Virgo versus the Zodiac Now, remember how I said that I wish I could prosecute people for not buying the top 3 games on this list? Well, in this case, I want to prosecute myself. Look, I've been saying for months now that I need to do a review on this game. Because quite frankly, it was the best game of 2019. No, not just the best overlooked game of 2019, the best game of 2019, despite playing it in early 2020. It was a game that I put on the level of Valhalla, which if you know the history of this channel, is putting the game in elite company. A game that not only smacked me in the face with how good it was, but flabbergasted me that not many people had even looked at it. Hell, I even almost looked it over, and only due to my girlfriend Andrea suggesting to stream it, did I end up falling in love with it. Hell, see this? This is custom artwork made by her. I mean, it is along the lines of Wonder Song, Persona 5, Chrono Trigger, Hollow Knight in my office. That should say something. Hell, I'm angry right now because I know I'm not going to get the review I wanted done for the Christmas sales like I said I would, to have both the 2019 and 2020 list to be focused on. But you know what? I hoping that this spot on number one of this list gives you some reason to give this little indie gem a chance, because my god, it needs it. First of all, it has a complex combat system for veterans of the genre based on a good difficulty that rewards paying attention to the complex battle animations to block and attack at the right times, but also has a layer strategy that's semi-simple, yet has a bunch of complexity with its tri-type attacks, statuses, and its blocking system that actually makes you want to block due to how defense and counters work in this game. Let's be honest, how many times did you actually block in Final Fantasy? Sure, you could play the game on a lower difficulty and still enjoy it, but playing through it again at the highest difficulty and struggling even after learning all the game's tricks was a joy because, well, I felt like victory was just outside my grasp, but still obtainable. That to me is the best system out there, the carrot being dangled just out of reach but still being able to reward you rather nicely. Boss fights are the highlight, 
is you try to use your equipment with unique attributes on both the defensive and offensive side of things to take advantage of each weakness. But then there's the story, which on the surface may seem like the typical JRPG story of fighting for a cause and battling others who don't see the light. But that's just not the case here. Virgo as a story highlights the complexities of how the stance of a character from one perspective may make them look like a hero, but from others it may make them look like a villain. Virgo is one of the most complex characters I've seen with her paladin-like attitude, but seeing the cracks from who she cares about under the surface and how that plays into her overall mission really brings a lot of emotion to the table. But even with that said, it's the writing in every aspect of the game that succeeds. Jokes hit constantly by walking around and interacting with things, getting a lot of chuckles out of me for even the silliest of jokes. All the Zodiac characters' different personas really bring a lot to the table to grab onto, and the twists and turns of how it plays into the overall story arc is captivating. I really don't want to go into deep into the actual story on this one because frankly, you should experience it for yourself. Listen, as you'll find out in the eventual review of the game, yes, it's still going to be done, the video game industry in all vectors has a problem with comparing games to others. It's easy to make a Dark Souls joke here to make my point, but that'd be overshadowing how bad the phenomenon has become. Every platformer has to be compared to Mario. Every adventure game has to be compared to Zelda. It's a plague that sets up way too high expectations for games and puts them in a box. Heck, I've done it plenty over the years as well. It'd be easy to make comparisons for Virgo vs. the Zodiac 2. But no. Not for this game. Virgo vs. the Zodiac is the Virgo vs. the Zodiac of this generation. It's the game that you need to play because I just told you to. Not because it's like anything else in the industry, but because it's its own thing. That it's polished to a shine and absolutely will make you fall in love with it. And hell, it's making me eye the next game by the developer Keylocker and wonder what kind of organ I have to sell so that I can get a review copy just so I can play it early. Do not be like me. Do not sleep on Virgo vs. the Zodiac. Don't. You will regret it. That's it for my 2019 Overlooked Games list. If there are games that I missed, realize that I did have a finite amount of time. I did go through a ton in terms of research for this video, even more than usual considering, well, I had a little bit more time considering a year had passed. But if there is a game that you think deserves to be on this list, put it in the comments section below and explain why. Now, coming up on Wednesday or Thursday of this week, probably Thursday, is the 2020 version of this list. So give a look for that video when it drops. And if you want more content like this, yeah, subscribe to the channel, blah, blah, blah. But if you want more indie game knowledge, go over to my Twitch and subscribe, or follow, I should say, follow there. That's where I do three or so streams of indie games per week and showing off most of the games that you've seen on this list over time. Anyway, this is Dragnik signing out, and I'll see you later in the week. But as always, keep on gaming.